hate when they sing really well because then I, you have to listen to me. Thankfully, we're going to read scripture between what they said and what I have to say. This morning, we are still in the book of Genesis. We have, uh, since we've started the narrative lectionary, we started with the creation story. And then we talked about our ancestor, Abraham. Today, we are actually going to jump ahead another generation, and we're with Jacob. To catch you up, Abraham and Sarah, after last week, did have a child. They had Isaac, and Isaac married and ended up having twins named Jacob and Esau. Most of us know the story of these two. They are constantly fighting, and Jacob is the younger brother who is constantly deceiving his older brother. When we meet him this morning, he has already stolen his brother's birthright. He has already stolen his brother's blessing and has run away. He has been away from Esau for years and years. Some people say about 20 years, but he's decided that he needs to go meet Esau again. But when we meet him this morning in chapter 32, he's still very nervous. And we meet him at night. He has sent his family, his two wives, his two maids, as we'll see, and his children across a river, and he's going to be by himself. Let us listen to what happens when Jacob is by himself. The same night, Jacob got up, and he took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything he had with him went with the women. Jacob was then left alone, and suddenly he wrestled with a man until daybreak. Now this man saw that he would not prevail against Jacob, so he struck him on the hip socket. Jacob's hip was put out of socket, but he continued to wrestle with him. Then the man said to him, let me go, the day is breaking. Jacob said, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what's your name? He said, Jacob. The man said, no longer will you be called Jacob, you are Israel, for you have striven with God and you have striven with humans and you have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called that place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. So therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Preachers, if we had our way sometimes, more often than not, want to proclaim a certain couple of things. We want to proclaim that God protects good people, the ones who follow Scripture, the ones who come to church on Sunday mornings, the ones who play by the rules. The other thing that we like to talk about are the people who exemplify the values that we want to proclaim, love of God, love of family, and we love nothing more than a good redemption story. Someone who was lost and then was found, someone who had a bad break but got back on their feet, someone who found Jesus. We love to preach those things. And then there's Jacob, the cunning, deceitful younger brother who breaks all the rules and then the worst part about it is he gets God's blessing three times. You will never hear a presidential candidate say, I am like Jacob. But we avoid him, don't we? And I wonder why we avoid him. He's in the Bible. His name is changed, as we heard this morning, his name is changed to Israel, and he becomes the father of the tribes of Israel, our ancestors. He's also, for those younger brothers, of which I am one, he is the first younger brother to be chosen by God, which I've used against my older brother, to be set apart as special, but still we avoid him because we don't really want to proclaim everything that he is about. I actually struggled with that this past Wednesday night. I'm helping Katie upstairs on Wednesday nights with Wondrous Wednesdays. I do the Bible study portion while she leads them in singing. This past week, we're studying the scriptures for this Sunday. We're using this really great children's Bible, but it was too sympathetic to Jacob. The way the kids were reading it, and I didn't want to interrupt them because they were reading it, and it was really special to listen to them read it, but Jacob was a good character. 
And all I kept doing was grabbing my hands like this and breaking my knuckles and saying, no, no, this is the kid who picks on others in the playground, and this is that kid that's in your class that's disruptive. It may be you. And he's the one who cheats on people in the streets. And the worst part is, you know what, kids? God loves him and blesses him. But I stopped myself. I put my hands together because I wanted my Thursday and Friday to be really calm. I had important work to do, like write this sermon and do other things, and I didn't have all the time in the world to talk to you parents and all the school administrators who would line up at my office door and say, let me tell you a story, Ben. These three kids just beat somebody up. They cheated them out of their lunch money, and you told them it was okay because God blesses people who do this. I struggle with the Jacobs of the world because as a minister, it is so hard to minister to them. They are never wrong. It is hard to not want to tell them you are the root of your own problems. Sometimes I wonder if Jacob came into the church for counseling, told me his relationship with his father and his brother isn't great, I'd be tempted to say, Jacob, stand up with me and walk to the bathroom. There is a really pretty mirror. Look in it. That's your problem. I'd tell him you are grasping for hope that can easily be found within yourself. Here are things you can do. Stop cheating, stop lying, stop stealing, and your life will be easy. How many of us have ever done that or wanted to do that to somebody else or even with yourself? You may have looked in that same mirror and said, well, there's the problem. If I just change this, this, and this, then all will be well. When we watch people on TV from afar, presidential candidates do this, don't they? We all say, if you would just do this, this, and this, your life would be well, would it not? We want to tell them that they're grasping for something that's right in front of them. They're grasping for themselves. But here's the problem. If Jacob came into my office and if I stood up with him and I took him to see that mirror, do you know what else I would see? I would see myself. I would see that I am actually Jacob too, that I've cheated, I've cut corners to get what I want, and I struggle every day, if not every hour, that I am the root of many of my own problems. So maybe Jacob isn't as bad as he seems, is what I would start to say. Maybe there's more to this Jacob character than we know what to do. You're smiling because you know exactly what I'm going to say next. Isn't it funny how we start to rationalize a story once we find ourselves in it? We will preach to the crowd when we find ourselves on the higher moral ground, but suddenly when we're on that lower floor, we start to rationalize, well, it wasn't my fault. Well, listen, preacher, let me tell you. And that's why Jacob is so hard to preach. Because he's everything that we despise about our brothers and sisters in humanity, but he's also each of us. Every time that we grasp at something to preach or proclaim, he slips right through our fingers. We point fingers at him and saying, that is Jacob. And then all of a sudden, we see the finger pointing at ourselves. And the truth is, we could spend our entire lives of faith wrestling with Jacob. But I think we would miss a major aspect of who Jacob is and what his story has to say to us. Because not only did Jacob wrestle with himself like we do, but Jacob also wrestled with God. And we forget about that aspect of this story. God is not actually named in this story, but we see God in it, right? God has also blessed this complex character and done it many times before. In fact, it started before he was even born. Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau, had the worst pregnancy in history because they were constantly fighting inside of her. Not only did she have twins as well. Then God said, do you know what's going on? They're fighting inside of you, and the younger one is actually going to win. Now, that's hard to hear for any mother or any parent or even any person because that goes against all the cultural norms of ancient Near East, but also today. Now, suddenly, we see that God is blessing Jacob. God is blessing the runts. God is blessing the has-beens the younger brothers, the misfits, and not only blessing them, but telling them that you too can be leaders. And that's where this story takes a turn for us, because it's not just a story of us grasping for hope through a wrestling match or through rationalizing where we find ourselves in this story, but it's actually God grasping for hope within each of us. 
I've often read this story, and you may have too, as one where Jacob seeks out this wrestling match. It's prime time. He's about to meet his brother. And ultimately, he's going to prevail, excuse me, because he's so stubborn. But what if the story of Jacob is actually the story of God? I thought about this, this this week when I read a quote about a great American thinker and philosopher of the 21st, excuse me, 20th century, John Dewey. He wrote this, the deepest urge in every human is the desire to be important. The deepest urge in human nature is the desire to be important. God knows that about you and me. God instilled that within us. But then that begs the question, what does it mean to be important? Is Jacob important? Because he got a birthright or a blessing and even a new name? Maybe. Do we have to die on a cross like Cynthia read this morning, like Jesus did? No, I don't think so, but it's something we think about. Is it important that we have a big bank account, a nice home, a pretty new car? Those things are nice, aren't they? Or is it important to give up everything, to be the Mother Teresa's of the world, to go live in poverty and care for the poor? Or should we quit our corporate jobs, our well-paying jobs, and become public school teachers? I know one person here that would love that, because you want to change the lives of young people around us. Or is it important to do any of those things if one thing is satisfied? If you are hoping and praying that someone will notice your efforts, and you will get this amazing write-up in a biography of one of those great new Southern magazines like Our State or Garden and Gun, or you'll get profiled by the Tar Heel Traveler on TV. Does importance mean others have to notice? I thought about that often when I was in seminary. I was thinking about other things as well, but that was one thing. What does it mean to be important as a minister? The hardest class that I ever took in my three and a half years there was Reformed theology. Let me explain, though. It takes some background information to understand why it was so hard. I was a third year. I was so trying to get out of there. But remember, I was a Presbyterian at a non-denominational seminary, and Reformed theology was not a regularly offered class. When I began school as a first year, they offered Reformed theology, but I laughed at it because I was going to do a PhD and didn't need that class. Well, I needed that class, so since the dean of the Vanderbilt was a Presbyterian pastor, I ran to his office, I ran right past his secretary, I knocked on his door, I went in and I pleaded with him, please help me graduate, I want to get out of here. He said, I'll think about it for a week. He shot me an email and he said, look, I'll teach the class. When you see the course offerings, just put down Reformed Theology with the dean and they'll know what to say. I thought, oh wow, this is pretty cool. When I saw the course offerings, the course was not actually in there and I thought, oh man, this is a super secret Presbyterian only thing. I bet you only have to get an email to get into this class. It was over winter break that I signed up and I came back to school. I got an email from the dean's secretary. She sent it to me, and she said, look, class is going to take place in his office. I didn't think much about that, because there was a a large number of Presbyterians, so I thought, this will be great. Now, I walked a little taller through the halls that day, but I didn't want to tell other people about what was going on, because I didn't want them to be jealous. I was about to walk in the dean's office, and it was a good thing. I entered his office, and the first thing he said to me, do you want some coffee? Yeah, I want some coffee. He closed the door and said, let's begin. Uh, Excuse me, are we waiting for others to show up? I managed to say between sips of my gourmet coffee, nope, it's just us, you and me, Ben. Now, let's get started. Tell me about Augustine's theology that reappears in John Calvin's writings. I took a deep breath and I sat there shocked and filled with fear because I was all alone. And do you know what it's like to be all alone in a class? You cannot put your head down. You cannot avert your eyes. You cannot cough or say, I need to use the restroom. All of those avoidance tactics are gone. And here's what makes this class even harder. The dean was notorious for loving silence. He did not care about silence. It did not make him anxious. Some of you are thinking, man, I would be like shifting to my seat. That's what I was doing. He just sat there and stared at me. He waited. 
and he waited. And I thought, how long is this class? He never told me. I've never felt so alone, but also so alive at that point. So I managed to think really quickly on my feet, and I thought of some theological words that were really big, and I thought of some other Reformed theologians that I needed to study that summer, or excuse me, that semester. And so I just threw out all these names, and I threw out all these terms, and I felt so smart, and I kind of sat back in my seat, and he looked at me, and he said, stop it. Stop trying to impress me and tell me what you think. Don't use other people's thoughts. Use Ben's thoughts. I stopped and said, you do realize that seminary education doesn't ask you what you think. You all have been telling us it's not what you think. You've been trying to teach us what you think so that we can go out in the world. He said, stop it. The church of which you are about to be ordained into and the world all around it is full of people who want to know what you think. And here's why. Because they want to know that they are not alone. I never forgot that last part. I had the greatest experience with that class. It was the hardest class I've ever taken, but I got to formulate my understandings of Reformed theology. I realized in that class and thinking about it this past week that maybe importance is recognizing that none of us wishes to be alone in our lives. This might be the hardest truth for us to hear because it means that we need others. It means that we cannot pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. It means that we cannot walk through life without each other and without God. And God has always known this about us, and that's why God keeps inviting us to wrestle with ourselves, to wrestle with Scripture as we did this morning, and to wrestle with everything in between. Now, we've done a great job of distracting ourselves from this truth. We've used social media. We've used the busyness of our family life. We've talked about the financial struggles that we have. We've talked about the lack of time that we don't have anymore to do what God has called us to do. Just this past week, I was playing with Margot upstairs in her room. She was the teacher, and I was one of her students amongst all of her dolls. I was just sitting there trying to play. She was very demanding, and so I kept pulling out my phone. I didn't have any reason to pull out my phone, but I was just bored and thought I would keep her distracted. She finally looked at me. She said, Daddy, stop. You don't need that. You need to be in school. I said, Amen, sister. Amen. I'm often tempted to throw my smartphone away. I dream of going back to the days of the flip phone. I've even entertained the idea of making a campaign to bring beepers back. All of this is aimed at dismissing the distractions of our lives. But then I think about Jacob. He had none of those modern technologies, and he was still distracted. He could not see God in his own life. He had to wrestle literally with God to see God. So sometimes I wonder, it's not our phones it's not our lives very much. It's just us not wanting to see God. But we are still grasping for hope, aren't we? We are grasping for God, and God is grasping for us. That's why we come to church. We open those doors, and we realize it's not just about us. And I want to stand up here and proclaim and preach all the good stuff of Scripture. I want to tell you about the rules to follow because that's easy and that's good stuff but I think we would miss a large portion of our God. Because God is in the lives of the Jacobs. God is in the lives of the Jacobs of our world, which means you and I, right? And God wants to sense our importance in ourselves, does God not? And so God is grasping at the hope that God sees in the most beautiful creatures God has ever created, you and me. May God bless this witness. And may God bless this congregation. Amen.